We looked down at ace-10 offsuit in the small blind almost five hours into the session. There's a straddle on. I raised the 70. The big blind is an action player. He likes mixing it up and has already shown down some big bluffs in bizarre spots. He three bets at 200. He's doing this kind of stuff at too high of a frequency. I'm not one to back down when facing re-raises that I suspect are total BS. If this guy wants to play street poker, I'll play street poker. I four bet to 600. He calls without batting an eye. His chips are almost in there at the same time as mine. If he had a really strong hand like aces, kings, or ace, king, he probably would have taken his time to contemplate five betting. The snap call of a four bet isn't something that I see very often. Could have been done with some type of mediocre hand that the opponent just wants to see a flop with. We're heads up out of position with over 1,200 in the middle. The flop comes 6-5 deuce with two spades. We've got absolutely nothing, and I'm kicking myself for choosing to deviate from my normal strategy pre-flop to tangle with a maniac. All hope isn't lost, there's actually still a chance that we could be ahead, given what we know about the opponent. I down bet to 300 to fold out his complete air hands. He calls once more almost immediately. There's not too much that I can gather from what's happened so far. No real idea what the opponent has. The turn is the king of diamonds. Part of me wants to bet, but I get the sense that this opponent may just call me down extremely light with a slightly better hand. I check with plans of giving up. I've already wasted 900 trying to outplay this nutball in his own style of poker. The big blind bets 750. Why did I get myself into this situation? It's been a pretty long session already. I was winning a good amount after being stuck several hundred to start. Now all that profit that I played hours for to get has been erased in this one pot if we don't win. Oh well, it's better to cut the losses at this point. But wait a minute. When the four bet was snap called, it became unlikely that the opponent would have aces, kings, or ace, king. This is a king high board that's great for my four bet range. I can still maybe have aces, kings, and ace, king in my range. Maybe the opponent has something decent like he's representing with a turn bet, but I've seen too many wild moves from him to fully believe him, and I've got one last trick up my sleeve. I check jam for 2460 total with absolutely nothing after four betting with a hand that should have been in the muck pre-flop. I'd never do this against someone who I thought played a conventional style of poker, but my image is incredibly good after I've only shown down strong hands all day. Sometimes, when you're playing against people who do unorthodox things, you've got to out unorthodox them. It's risky. In fact, at any second, it could cost me my whole stack. The opponent has almost the exact same amount of chips as us. It's 1710 more for him to call. The fact that we haven't gotten called yet is encouraging, but it's nerve wracking as I'm sitting here waiting for the big blind to make a decision. It doesn't seem like he could have ace king. He must either have the ace high flush draw or some other pair. One minute goes by, and the opponent doesn't appear to be any closer to a decision. He's trying to piece together my story, and he's understandably having a tough time. I was hoping it'd look really strong to check raise all in on the turn. It at least appears to be believable, as three minutes in, the big blind goes through his thought process out loud about what he puts me on. You want to run it once or twice if I, if I call? If I call. It's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to me. We're playing with fire. A lot of the time, I won't answer people in a big pot when they ask me a question like that, but I gave a subtle answer that I thought sounded most like I wanted the call to throw him off the scent. And it's the truth. If he calls, we'll run it as many times as he wants. I'll probably lose every run out anyway. I might even be drawing dead. Four minutes goes by and the opponent still doesn't have his mind made up, but he makes it clear what he thinks that I have as he pretends to have pocket aces but no one believes him. But I'm on ace, king of spade, I don't know why. If you miss, I take it all. I want him to hit an ace on the rim. I have the other ace that I want to miss. What the opponent is saying is complete nonsense. There's no way that he has pocket aces. And if he puts me on ace, king of spades, he doesn't need to river an ace. He'd have called by now with ace, king, or aces. He's wasting everyone's time with his make-believe story. I have no clue what he actually has, but it must not be that strong if he has to pretend to have something else. After almost five full minutes, the opponent finally folds. We get the biggest bluff that I've ever attempted in 510 through. I show the table just like the opponent did in other hands when he got bluffed through. Ooh, nice play. Brad tried to punt. Nice play. Did try to punch. It's fun to nice play. Thank you. I can't believe it. I only have one pair. I mean, two pair would have cost me. With the successful bluff, we're up 2,500 on the session. After outcrazying the lunatic, he said that he had all kinds of hands that didn't make sense. 
After folding, the opponent was still trying to pretend like he had aces, then when no one believed him, he changed his story and said that he had ace-five offsuit, good for third pair, which is more believable, but he may have had neither hand. I'm incredibly relieved that the play worked. If the buy-in at Bellagio hadn't increased to a 2500 max, there's no way that this hand would have happened. The structure change has already been beneficial for us, and now our opponent is going to be riled up. A bit later, we're dealt pocket sevens in the hijack. I raised to 60,000. The opponent in the big blind has about 30 BBs. He calls with king five offsuit. As your stack gets shorter, the value of having a high card goes up considerably, and you can justify making calls with worse and worse hands, like this one containing only one high card. We're heads up in position. The flop comes ace, queen, five, all diamonds. I'll have nearly all the possible king high flushes in my range, aside from king three and king deuce of diamonds, and I'll have other strong hands like smaller flushes, all the sets, ace, queen, and ace, five suited. I'm pretty content with the flop, thinking that it's possible that my opponent flopped a flush, but he would have three bet or jammed pre-flop with hands like aces, queens, ace, queen, and ace, king. The opponent checks. Our hand doesn't really have that much value and will only get worse as more diamonds or more high cards come out. It's a flop that's pretty good for our range though. I put out a small bet of 50,000 to see if we can get the opponent to fold a hand with equity, and really just to see how he responds. I anticipate getting check raised by almost all the flushes in the big blinds range except maybe king high flushes. As the opponent is pondering about what to do, I don't get the sense that he's really thinking about raising me. He calls, then he checks his cards for a diamond. The vast majority of the time when people do this, it's because they only have one diamond in their hand at most. Usually if you have suited cards, you're able to remember what suit they are. With this look, I can rule out the opponent having all set and two pair combos as well because it wouldn't be possible for him to be holding a diamond, he'd know that. The fact that he didn't check raise, again, basically rules out almost all flush combos. I pretty much put the opponent on an ace or queen with at most one diamond in his hand. It's also possible that we're up against king jack, king 10, or jack 10 with a diamond. The turn is the 10 of clubs, it's another Broadway card, the big blind checks, He'll never have a set of 10s either after calling preflop, although he could have combos of King Jack, Ace 10, and Queen 10 that would give him some strong hands. I'll have all those as well, plus a set of 10 sometimes. I keep the pressure on with a bet of 175,000. Now is when I'd expect to see a check raise from King High Flushes. Once again, we don't get it, the big blind calls. I'm still putting him on one pair of combos. It feels like Ace X, maybe King Queen, Queen Jack, or Jack 10 with a diamond. The river is the 9 of hearts, we've got 5th pair. The big blind checks one last time, I've got one of the worst hands that I'll have, and I don't think that I'll be able to win at showdown. The way I've played this so far, I can have flushes, straights, sets, and two pair. The way that the opponent has played this, he really won't have flushes, can't really have sets, and won't have top two pair. My general sense is that no matter what, the opponent won't be able to call a shove. If he has a hand like king eight offsuit, we're way ahead, but if the opponent has a hand like ace six, or even a hand as good as queen ten, I still don't think that he's going to want to call an overbet jam. I announced that I'm all in. Five in your hand instead. It's oh. Brad turning the sevens into a bluff and oh. jamming. Okay, Brad. All right. I'm doing this purely as a bluff, but if I somehow have the best hand, then that's even better because there's no risk of us losing the pot. Aside from believing that I'm not up against a super strong range of hands, there are a few other ancillary factors that led me to thinking that a bluff at this point would have a higher probability of getting through. First, I've won every hand at Showdown, even showed strong hands when I didn't have to after making aggressive plays, like when I 3-bet my friend with Kings. Also, there was a hand previously when the same opponent ran into quad deuces after 3-betting preflop with ace-jack suited. He called a fairly large sized river bet with ace high and lost a big chunk of his stack. Normally, you might think that you don't want to run a bluff through a guy who just showed that he was willing to call light, but Daniel said after, now at least you guys know that you shouldn't try and bluff me and he did it in a way that seemed like he was slightly embarrassed that he called, and like he didn't want anyone to try and bluff him going forward so that he wouldn't potentially be embarrassed again. When you know what your opponent wants to do or doesn't want you to do, disappoint him. Going back to the sevens hand, I really don't think that he'd want to call light again and be wrong on stream for his tournament life. He probably has friends and family watching, plus his run could be over if he calls with an ace or some other two pair type of hand. This shove puts a ton of pressure on him. If he folds, he for sure stays alive, and I'll still have about 25 big blinds, which he can certainly run up. A lot of this is moot because we see that we actually have the best hand, but this is one of the most interesting hands that I play in the whole tournament because I make this shove after considering a multitude of components that all came together. First, there was the live read of seeing Daniel check his cards while making the call on the flop. Also, this is a board with mostly high cards. I didn't get check raised on the flop, so we ruled out a ton of strong hands based on how it was played pre-flop and on the flop. 
Then there's my image, which is perhaps as solid as it gets. Finally, there's game flow and pressures of being on stream and not wanting to look silly by making an incorrect call twice for lots of chips, and in this instance, for your tournament life. Daniel folds and I'm disappointed to find out that he had king five because I think he'd fold much better hands than that and much better hands than ours. We win a sizable pot either way and we're not done. Pick up pocket aces for the first time today in the cutoff. A player in middle position does some of the heavy lifting for us by raising to 40. He's another pro who's probably the new first or second toughest opponent for us at the table. You can see him sitting right across from us. I'll give you one guess as to the continent he's from. I'll give you a clue. He's not from North America, South America, Africa, Australia, or Asia. That's right, he's Antarctican. I three bet to 140 to pump this pot up a little. The opponent isn't impressed with how much we pump. He pumps it back to 540. Sometimes in poker, there are some reg battles that occur when two players are going at each other to either establish dominance or because they know the other is capable of three or four betting light. That could be what's going on here, but I don't get that sense so much. The opponent started the hand with over 4,700. He'd like to acquire all of it, and the sooner we get the money in, the better. I five bet to 1,100, giving the opponent an opportunity to either call or six bet jam. Five bets are very rare. The opponent looks at me as if to say, I've got a strong hand. We both got big stacks. Do you really want to play for all of it against me here? The answer is yes, I do. He's getting three to one and can't fold any pocket pair or a hand like ace king, maybe even ace queen suited. He calls, we're heads up with over 2,000 in the middle already. Effective stack to pot ratio is low, meaning it'll be easy to get the rest of the chips in the middle. The flop comes queen 10 seven rainbow. It's not the best because we could be up against pocket queens and pocket kings won't feel comfortable putting in tons of money since that hand doesn't beat aces or queens. Ace king is also live against us. The opponent checks, if we're up against a set, He's just going to double up through me and win a pot of over $9,000 in a 5-10 game because I'm not going to be folding aces after 5 betting. It doesn't help to worry about that at the moment. Instead, I need to target hands that I'm beating and figure out a way to extract the max from pocket kings and ace king. If the player has ace king, he won't be able to call a large bet because in a 5 bet pot, he'll either be chopping or he'll be drawing extremely slim on this flop. A jack is the only card that he'll feel good about seeing. I make a significant down bet to 600 so that the opponent basically has to call with ace king, ace queen, kings, or even jacks. If he does call, he'll have less than a pot size bet left in his stack, all by design. The small sizing should look a lot like I could have ace king with hopes of keeping control of the pot while getting to see a turn relatively cheaply and perhaps even a river cheaply if I want to check back the turn. The opponent only calls, which he still might have done with top set. There are just way more combos of hands that we're beating than there are a top set. The turn is the five of diamonds. It's a blank, except there's a flush draw out there now, and the ace of diamonds is unaccounted for. The opponent checks. He's got just over 3,000 in his stack. We've got him covered. It wouldn't be super unreasonable to jam, but what exactly would that accomplish? Every combination of ace-king other than ace-king of diamonds would snap fold. Ace-queen would probably feel inclined to fold also, and we saw me fold pocket kings on a queen high board to a shove in a similar spot earlier. A shove may fold out every hand that I'm beating and only get called by top set. I go a very tricky route with a check back. As long as a jack doesn't come out, I'll be fairly confident that we've got the best hand. This check back will look a ton like we've got ace king and it could induce some bluff shoves from our opponent if he has ace king and we can still shove on the river to get maximum value out of kings and ace queen hands. Potentially, you can even get called light by pocket jacks. The river is another 10. There really aren't any 10s that the opponent will have in his range, other than maybe some tiny percentage of the time he'll have pocket 10s, and there's only one combo of that possible. Overall, I feel good about a non-diamond 10 coming out. I feel even better as the opponent checks. After we check back the turn, I'd anticipate the opponent betting or shoving for value with queens full, though there's a possibility that he could be checking to induce a bluff shove. Now is when we make our play, we're going to go for it all, either get snap called by a boat, get a snap fold out of ace king, or we'll see the opponent go into the tank with the worst hand that he'll feel obligated to call with, knowing that he's getting over 2 to 1. It's the moment of truth. On. On. We don't get snap called, so we almost for sure have the best hand. A small seabed and check back on the flop, followed by a shove on the river, should look very suspect should look like I'm making a desperate last ditch effort to steal this pot with ace king to potentially get my opponent off a chop or get him to fold a hand like ace queen or kings. 
the player clearly doesn't have ace-king as he's taking his time contemplating what to do. I don't envy his situation at all. I was in nearly the same one with probably the same hand on a very similar board. If he calls, this will be the biggest pot that I've ever won in a 5-10 game. I've never been in a hand like this down the street at Bellagio in the 1500 cap game. The biggest pot I've won in the 5-10 there is maybe 5,500 to 6,000. We still need to get called if we want to eclipse that amount and I know our opponent is good enough to fold. I can tell that he's not happy, but after over a minute, he puts in the calling chip. We give him the bad news. We win the biggest pot that I've ever won in a 5-10 game. There was no straddle on this hand, so it's truly a pot of over 900 big blinds in what I'm sure is a cooler situation. There's some tiny chance that we got called by jacks due to our line appearing strange, but it's way more probable that the opponent had pocket kings. We were able to win the absolute max from a solid pro. He wants to buy back the chips that we acquired from him. Rather than pushing his stack to us, he takes out three yellow 1k chips to hand over to us instead. What I was already considering to be a great day has gotten even better for us. We've got 12,700 in our stack and we're only in for 3,000. We're getting close to a $10,000 profit. Later we're dealt ace 5 suited onto the gun, I open a 30. The player in middle position 3 bets to 120. He's the nemesis from the hand when I 4 bet preflop and jammed river with pocket kings. I have no idea what he had in that hand, but shortly after he made it sound as if he didn't have much. He's also the player who I paid off on the river with Queen Jack when he had the straight. We're both extremely deep. I'm up 2,000 on the night. I've gotten a huge chunk of the downswing money back this session already. I could approach this conservatively with a call or even a fold. I got fancy 5 betting A6 suited in the last vlog and got stacked. There's no real shame in finding a better spot or locking up a win, but with his raise, I just decide, you know, I don't care about the money. I'm just going to outplay the guy. I'm just going to outplay the guy this hand. I re-raise. I make it 400. Play right back at him. The opponent's thinking about his decision. Unfortunately, he doesn't fold and ask if I had it. He calls. We're heads up out of position in a four bet pot and we both have well over 3,000 in front of us. The flop comes 10-9-4 rainbow. We've got nothing. Rags, if you will. The only thing keeping me from giving up is my over and backdoor draws. I make it 450 to potentially get folds out of ace king and ace queen hands with no backdoor flush draws. Even jacks and queens aren't going to love facing this bet. The player once again thinks for a while, then he calls. I'm going to need some help. The dealer puts out the jack of clubs, which is a very tricky card since we pick up the nut flush draw, but the opponent could have improved to a set of jacks. Also, if he has a hand like queens or ace queen, it'll be tough to bluff him off those holdings. There's 1700 in the pot, the player has 2350 in his stack, and I have him slightly covered. Me from a year or two ago probably would have never 4-bet ace-5 suited from under the gun preflop and wouldn't have ever gotten himself into this tough situation. Even if he did, he'd probably check or bet on the smaller side here, afraid that he's up against the nuts. That guy's okay. I wouldn't invite him to my birthday or anything though, but after getting more experience in the higher stakes games and getting coaching from Nick Petrangelo, one of the absolute best players in the world, I feel like a different person. When a new me looks down, he sees that he has a much bigger I didn't get snap called, so once again, I'm not up against a two pair better hand. I may be up against kings or queens, maybe something else. It's going to be very tough for him to call with one pair, even if he has an open ended straight draw to go with it. Every time I've shoved for a large amount against him in the past, I've been strong. I did it with trips in the other session, then an over pair earlier in this session. This is pretty much the only hand that I bluff shove with here. Because of that, I definitely would have to balance it out by shoving turn with aces or kings for value. I'm patiently waiting to find out if I'm going to get this bluff through to be up almost 3,000 on the session, or maybe I'll get called and I'll get lucky to win. Of course, what's more likely if I get called is that I'll pretty much lose everything and I'll be even deeper in the downswing than before I started the session, playing with very little confidence going forward. After a minute and a half goes by, the opponent makes an irreversible decision. Oh. Wait. Right. Let's go twice. Twice? Most of the time, when I'm asked if I want to run it once or twice, I just run it once. In a pot nearly $7,000 at 5 in the morning with a hand that's almost for sure not the best, 
After battling all night and trying to string some wins together to get out of a downswing, twice seems fine. The first river is the six of spades. It hurts like a punch to the gut. The only thing I have left is a small chance to at best win half the pot. In an instant, I could lose all the money that I've won up to this point in the session unless we see a black clover on the second run out. If you've made it this far, hit the like button on the count of three for some extra run good. We're going to need it. Ready? One, two, three. The deuce of clubs comes out. We make the absolute nuts at the buzzer. I'm glad we switched it up to run it twice this time in order to be guaranteed half the pot. You know how I said in the prior episode that I never make backdoor draws? Well, sometimes I do. It just takes two attempts at it. That was one of the most stressful hands that I've ever played, especially just to chop up $15 of blinds. The opponent is a little bit shocked to see what I have, then eventually shows that he made a very difficult but correct call with pocket queens. We put maximum pressure on him, but you've got to give him credit for sticking in there with really just a bluff catcher. We needed help to hit one of 12 outs, and we got it. I so bad in the toy department. <laughs> nice. nice. Despite not even winning the pot outright, it's one of my favorite hands that I've ever played. I'd send the details to Nick, who says that I played it perfectly, and that made me feel pretty good. During a coaching session, we talk about this one in depth, going through what my range should look like, what my opponent's range will look like, what I'd do in slightly different situations, and we ran it through a solver which confirmed that I should have played it the exact way that I did, while the opponent should have also played it the exact way that he did. My coaching session with Nick was filmed and will be part of an upswing course along with other hand histories of mine and comprehensive strategy concepts which will be released in the next few weeks. We'll talk about that in future episodes though, I've still got poker to play. It's time for another bomb pot. Every player puts in $100 each, we're playing 7 handed at the moment. If we win, we'll have gotten all the way out of the $6400 hole that we were in. We look down at pocket queens in the big blind. It's normally one of the worst times to pick up a premium pocket pair because, like I said earlier, one pair of hands rarely win at showdown in bomb pots when there are so many opponents, so you typically have to improve to two pair or better. And we do. The dealer puts out queen queen nine rainbow, we flop quads with 700 in the middle, and not a damn worry in the world. I've never had quads in a bomb pot before, certainly not during a high stakes session. The only concern of mine is how are we possibly going to get paid when we've got everything. Small blind checks, there's no way that we'll be betting when I'm second to act and all the queens are accounted for. I check, hoping someone will get out of line. No one bites, it checks around. The turn is the eight of spades at least putting a flush draw on the board and completing a possible straight. Small blind checks, I'm a patient guy, I can't let this check through again though. I make a small bet of 200 to get things going. I wouldn't be too surprised if this folds around, I actually think it's the most likely outcome. All hope isn't lost. Rob takes two black chips from his stack and calls in middle position. The hijack and cutoff fold. The button, who we've tangled with multiple times, is considering his options. I told you earlier he makes aggressive plays at strange times. This would be amazing if he raised here. I don't want to do anything that might tip him off that we've got the absolute nuts. Still, in my head I'm thinking, please do something wild. He comes through and raises to 1100. This seems like a bluff since we've got all the queens. I don't know if he'd raise with a straight on this board, or maybe he has 9's full or 8's full. The small blind folds, I was originally thinking that I may not get any customers with my $200 bet. Now that I've gotten called and then raised, I'm thinking about the best way to stack one or maybe even two players. There's no reason to risk scaring anyone off, we don't need to re-raise for protection. I flat the 1100, Rob can't justify calling for 900 more, he folds, it's down to heads up with a guy who I know is capable of taking huge risks. He sees an opportunity to win a pot. It's the perfect setup. The river is the seven of clubs. It doesn't change much since Jack-10 was already a straight. The button has exactly 5,000 left in his stack. We have him covered. The pot is only 3,100, so it could be tough to get everything. I don't want to risk this checking through since it's highly likely that the opponent is bluffing and may shut down after I called his raise on the turn with another player behind me. I put out a fake blocker bet of 600 to appear as if I'm weak and trying to get to showdown cheaply. I've already seen multiple times today, including earlier in this hand, that the opponent has no aversion to raising. We just need him to take the bait here. If he has air like a missed flush draw, he may make a last ditch effort to try and steal the pot after seeing a weak looking bet. If he has a really strong hand like a full house, or possibly even a straight, he'll probably think that I have trick queens and he can raise for value. Almost no matter what he has, he'll feel some inclination to make it more. He takes the black chips that he's shuffling in his hand, adds it to a much larger stack of black chips, and then raises to 2600. 
I don't play these stakes that often. It's tough to flop quads and even more rare to get raised twice in the same hand while having the absolute nuts. This is an unbelievable feeling. Let's just take a second to enjoy this and hit the like and subscribe buttons. We've made the maximum. Yes, the button still has another 2400 in the stack, but there's no way that he can call a shove, even if he has pocket nines for what we know is the second nuts, because it's too likely that I'll have queen nine, queen eight, or queen seven for a better full house, and I wouldn't bluff or re-raise with anything worse. Still, we have to go for it. I put in the inevitable all-in re-raise for 5,000 effective. The button can't believe it. He must not have been raising as a bluff on the river because he doesn't snap fold. I get the sense that he knows he's beat. He's got to see it though. He tosses in a calling chip. We've officially made the most that we could possibly make. We never find out what the opponent had. It must have been either jack 10, pocket nines, or pocket eights. They're all pretty similar in this instance because they don't beat the hands that I'm representing. It's an insane $13,000 pot that comes our way. Earlier on, it seemed like I was destined to lose every chip that I had in front of me. I was stuck several thousand dollars and a favorite to be down 10,000. We got some magic in two separate hands with pocket queens to now be up 6,000 on the session. The day is completely turned around. It isn't over either. With just a few hands left of the stream, under the gun raises to 20. We've got ace jack offsuit on the button. I call, the opponent on our left is getting a discount. He calls in the small blind. The big blind has two cards with shapes, numbers, and colors, so he justifiably calls for 15 more with a hand that can easily make the nuts if three threes or three sixes happen to come out. We're going four ways to the flop. It comes jack 10 deuce rainbow. We've got top top and a lot of equity. Checks to us. We've got a bet for value and to charge straight draws and other hands containing an over. I bet 50. Small blind has a straight draw that he doesn't want to have to hit. He puts in a tiny check raise to 135 in an attempt to steal the pot with nine high. The other two players don't have much. They fold, the action's back on me, the small blind doesn't have a whole lot left. I figure he's either going to have me crush with jack 10 or a set of deuces, or he's going to be bluffing with a straight draw of some sort. If the small blind has a gutter with 9-7 suited, king 9 suited, or queen 8 suited, I want to let him bluff off his stack on the turn if it's a brick. I call, with the plans of calling a turn shove. The dealer puts out the 7 of diamonds, I'm drawing dead, the small blind smashes it hitting the 1 card that'll get him paid because queen came, it'd be a lot easier to get away from. The small blind follows through with a jam. I snap call with no hope. I'm not surprised to see the straight. I was just hoping that the opponent was going to have one of several other straight draws instead. The river is another 10. It's inconsequential. My time on the stream isn't particularly fun. I wasn't in any great situations to go for value. And I kept running into the nuts on the turn and fairly big pots. My profit for the day is wiped out as the meetup game is officially over but there are still tables running that me and Andrew haven't gotten to yet, and I'm stuck a small amount. We're going into OT. About a half hour in, we get an opportunity to get in the mix. By the way, there's at least one straddle on for every hand, so this one is 25, 50, 100. Doug has pocket jiggities and a second act preflop. He raises to 250. We've got something that we'd like to play. We're in kind of early middle position with pocket sixes. This is a spot where the vast majority of players are going to flat the initial preflop raise with the small to medium pocket pair under these conditions. That's totally fine, but I've been doing some studying with Nick Petrangelo for part of the cash game course that's still going to be coming out on upswing. It's just been pushed back a few months and is scheduled to be released in the fall now. Anyway, here's a look at the preflop chart Petrangelo gave me for this exact situation. You'll notice that you're supposed to play a tight range since there are still several players left to act behind. It's mostly a three better fold strategy. Even with sixes, Folding well over 50% of the time is the correct play, mixed in with some calls and some three bets that you see represented with the green. When I'm on stream, I try to take the more aggressive line as often as possible. The camera barely picks it up in the left of the screen, but I three bet to 700. It's not necessarily something that Doug or anyone else at the table would expect, and these guys are sharp guys. I need to do things that will occasionally catch people off guard in order to be successful at these stakes. Wow, Brad getting after it here, three bets to 700. Hey, my one thing from the fridge, Soda. Coming. Owner on owner crime here. Partial owners of the club, Doug Polk, Brad Owen. That's what guys. Doug makes the call, which he's supposed to do around 80% of the time because often I'll have at least two overs, if not an over pair. My three bet with sixes is just a low frequency play. Sometimes when you take a risk, you get punished. 
and sometimes you get rewarded. The flop comes 10-6 deuce rainbow, we've got a completely hidden middle set, and what's even better is that Doug has an overpair to the board. Doug checks, we've got the second best hand possible, and what's becoming a large pot. I want to make sure that we're able to keep the opponent in with a wide variety of holdings, and possibly induce a check raise. We down bet to 500 to make it very enticing to at least stick around with a call. This board won't always be great for my range, pretty regularly I'll just have an ace high type of hand that Doug may want to protect against. Doug just calls, which I anticipated him doing with lots of hands, so this doesn't help me narrow down his range too much. He could have a 10, maybe two overs with backdoor draws, maybe small or medium pocket pairs, and there's some small chance that he has jacks or queens, but those are discounted since he didn't 4-bet us pre-flop, which he'll do at least some percentage of the time, and he didn't check raise us on the flop, which he'll probably do some percentage of the time as well. The turn is the 3 of clubs, it's a sweet card because no additional hands are beating us that are plausible. If Doug has 3s, we might be able to get it all in. If he has fours or fives, we can probably get at least one more additional street of value. Hands like nines and eights won't be afraid of the three either. Doug checks again. We need to start building this pot up a little more. Ideally, we want to set ourselves up to get all the money in on or by the river. I bet 1200. It's slightly less than half the pot. Maybe it's on the small side considering what Doug has and what I just stated is our goal, but it makes it seem as if maybe I'm playing cautiously or afraid of something, and it again provides an opportunity for Doug to check raise us. The smaller we bet, the more hands opponents can check raise us with. Doug's going nowhere for that price. He calls. Now I'm beginning to think that queens and jacks are a lot more likely, given that Doug's made it all the way to the river after I 3-bet preflop, bet on the flop, and bet on the turn. I still wouldn't be too surprised to be up against ace-10 suited, nines, eights, sevens, fives, and fours. The river is the eight of hearts. I'm somewhat worried that we're up against a set of eights. Other than that, it's a great card. I don't have to be concerned that Doug will have 9-7 suited because he would have folded that at some point pre-flop. Doug checks. I want to target his queens, jacks, and ace-10 hands because he won't be calling a third barrel with many other combos. Overpairs and top pair hands should be able to call a fairly large bet. I consider shoving for around 8,000. I might do that as a bluff with a hand like Miss Clubs, ace-5, or ace-4. I just don't want to squander this opportunity to make at least some money and give Doug a chance to get away from something like an overpair, which he's definitely capable of folding if I jam. I announce about a 4,000. A quick 4,000, and see Brat, Doug's face, he's disgusted. He's got a bad feeling in his stomach, but I think he's gonna lean on making the call, but what, what is really Brad doing this with? Is he really gonna barrel three streets on me with a, a busted big slick, ace, queen, etc.? Queens plus have you beat, tens, eights, possible sets. So Doug losing two a lot, and if anybody can make a good fold, it's the two seed. We've seen him do it. Vanessa, I mean, I mean Doug, is deep in the tank. He hates the spot that he's in. I'm glad to see him thinking hard about this one because this is the first moment that I 100% know that we've got the best hand. Despite being in a difficult situation, Doug is still cracking jokes. I'd be joining you on the stuck train here. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about boarding trains to Stuckville. Population one currently with McLovin in the nine seat buried 10K. Doug's travel plans sound amazing, but I'm doing my best to show no emotion. The longer that he contemplates what to do, the more likely it is that he has a top pair hand or an over pair. I know it, and Doug knows that I know it. You know what hand I have. It's your hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the jiggities. Makes the call, shows the set, and Brad Owen, big pot. We get the call to win a huge pot against one of the main people who inspired me to make poker content on YouTube. I'd watched Doug and Jason Somerville for a long time before seeing Andrew, and then eventually deciding to start my own channel. Studying Doug's Poker Lab course on upswing was also pivotal for my poker career, so while it's bittersweet to win against a friend at the table, this is a cool hand for me for multiple reasons. The third hand dealt, I pick up ace three suited under the gun plus one, I raise to 600. This is it, we're going to battle. It's gonna be interesting here because this has gotta be one of the largest games that Brad's ever played in, I would say. Oh yeah. Yes. So if not the largest. It is. Yeah, if not the largest and he's gonna play a hand here. I saw that Boots called with King 10 of hearts, it's not up there, but he, he raised to 600, Brad did, and um, Boots called and he's gonna get some action here from hook two with black eight, so. Right off the bat, it looks like uh, Doug Polk getting a price. Going to come in there with the five-deuce suited, so four ways. 
Frank gives us a flop. Oh, how about an eight in the door? And look at this. Brad has the nut flush draw. Ooh. So this is going to be a big, big pot or could be. We've got the nut flush draw and one over and a four-way pot on a board that will theoretically be way better for my range than anyone else since I open from early position and there are two Broadway cards. Doug checks with his complete air. I consider checking, but since this is so good for me as the under the gun plus one preflop raiser, I bet 2200 is a semi-bluff. I don't anticipate getting raised because none of my opponents will ever have a set of kings or queens. The absolute best hand that anyone will have is a set of eights. And the only two pair combination that makes sense for the opponents other than Doug is king queen. If anyone calls my bet, it'll just build the pot in case I make the nuts, but I expect my opponents to fold pretty often. That won't be happening. The middle position opponent whose cards aren't up on the screen calls with king ten of hearts. He has top pair and isn't close to being my main concern. The button flopped bottom set. It's the hand that I said would be the absolute best that any of my opponents could have. It's one of only two holdings that I anticipate the button will raise me with for value. Hook makes it 11,000 to go. Doug folds in the big blind. If I call for 9,000 more, the pot will be 27,000 and I'll have 18,000 left in my stack. I'll be completely pot committed and won't really be able to fold to a turn shove, getting almost 3 to 1 on a call at that point. Since there are so few value hands that my opponent will have, and his range is capped at pocket eights, whereas I can have all the sets and two pair hands, I think that there's some chance that I could even be best. Hook is definitely capable of raising with some kind of worse draw. He's one of those guys who played for hours before the stream. During that time, he got into a hand with my friend Mike Delvecchio when Hook 5-bet shoved Ace Jack off suit preflop for 70,000 effective. Hook is a wild guy who can sometimes play with reckless abandonment. I can't see myself folding the nut flush draw on a flop against his opponent, and I won't be folding on the turn either. It's much better to get my money in now. I rip it to hopefully catch Hook making a move. Perhaps I can win this without seeing another card come out, but worst case scenario, I'll have two shots of hitting a diamond if I get called. The middle position player snap folds his pair of kings. Hook doesn't even snap call with his set. He's never folding a set for 18,000 more though. He makes the call, which I'm not thrilled to see, but I missed a lot of draws and all-ins on previous streams this week. I'm kind of feeling like I'm due. Brad just snap uh, gets it in here with ace three of diamonds. This is happening in about under seven seconds. Wow, he's going to be about a three to one dog here against the set. How many times are we running it, boys? In every single all-in situation this week on stream, I've run it once for max pain, including several pots for 20,000 or more. So guess what we'll be doing here? Right. They're going twice. They're so going about twice. Six, well, over 60 grand because Brad started with 30. Ugh. Plus plus the dead money out there. So they're going to go twice here, boys. Brad looking for a diamond. A non-board pairing diamond. <laughs> Doug says, what's happened for blood? Last time Brad wanted to go one time blood for the stream. But this time we're going twice. Can't well, blame him. If Brad can escape and win one here, that's going to be a good result for him. Yeah. We're going twice. This is three hands into a nosebleed game with a pot two times bigger than any pot I've ever been involved in. The risk for me is already at an all-time high. No need to make things any wilder than they are when I'm shot taking. I've got about a 50% chance of chopping this. If I can somehow win both runouts, I'll be up over 30,000. The first turn is the ace of hearts giving me a meaningless pair. The only significance is that had I just flatted the flop raise, there's no sliver of a doubt that I would have called a turn shove. Over $30,000 of this pot is going to be determined by the next card. The river is the four of spades. We brick, and I'm both somewhat deflated by the outcome and also happy that I chose to run it twice, so I have a second chance for at least getting my money back. Only one other player folded the diamond preflop, which is why the four of diamonds is grayed out in the top right. The second turn is the ten of spades. It gives me a gut shot straight draw. I have one last chance at hitting, or I'll be stuck more than I've ever been stuck in my life. There's tons of tension at the table. I'm sure that the viewers of the stream are on the edge of their seats, so we're about to be extremely relieved or devastated. I kid you not, at this exact moment, the stream cuts out. Here's what the viewers saw. But the tone has been set, ladies and gentlemen. If you are here early, you've been rewarded. I'd love to tell you that the second river was a diamond and we chopped, but it was a brick, and I'm only able to keep my chips because I'm in the process of buying them back from Hook. I missed four chances at a diamond to lose by far the biggest pot that I've ever played. It's hard for me to process what's going on. I'm not even settled into the game yet. I can't help but think about my friends and family who are watching, my girlfriend and her two daughters who stayed up to watch as I immediately get obliterated. Terrace raises to a thousand in the hijack with 10-7 suited. We're on the button with ace, king, and clubs. I three bet to 3,000 in position. 
We're looking to play a big pot. Brad with big slick suited. He's starting to heat up. Artie wants more hands today than he's won all of yesterday through 18 hands. This seems like it'd be a fairly standard fold from Terrace, but he has other ideas. He goes with what can only be described as an unconventional four bet to 10,000. For quite a while after folding trips, he seemed to be on tilt. Since then, we three bet him and he had to fold his pocket fours. I also just won the last pot. Terrace may think that I'm bullying him and the rest of the table, and he appears to be taking a stand. Under normal circumstances, I may just flat the four bet and play this in position. Because I get the sense that Terrace is making a play with a much wider range than usual, I'm comfortable putting in a five bet to 27,000. It's a large amount, I wouldn't mind inducing a fold from a hand like the one that Terrace has so I can win his 10,000 without even having to see a flop. If Terrace shoves, I'll call without necessarily loving getting it in against a six bet all in for 95,000 effective, but once again, I want to prove that I don't have commitment issues. Terrace must really have it out for me because rather than fold a junky hand to a five bet for more than a fourth of our stacks, he flats for 17,000 more. Part of me thinks that he has aces, a big part of me thinks that he has ace king, queens or jacks, and I also think there's a good chance that he has some completely ridiculous hand that in no universe, Marvel Cinematic or otherwise, it makes sense to play this way. With 55,000 in the middle, we're heads up in position, hoping to at least make a pair. The flop comes 10-9-6 rainbow, it's about as good as it gets for Terrace. He checks, while there's certainly some merit to checking back, after 5 betting preflop, we're going to be seed betting at an extremely high frequency because we'll have such a narrow range consisting of basically just aces, kings, nace, king. I bet 17,000. It's around a third of the pot. Maybe we can get our opponent to fold ace, king if that's what he happens to have also. Or given that it's Terrace and he obviously is in revenge mode, maybe he folds another completely random hand that still has equity. I actually don't think it's even worth it to try and speculate what range of hands he'll have when in this instance, he calls a 5 bet and shows up with 10 7 of hearts. Terrace happens to have top pair and a straight draw plus a backdoor flush draw. He gets rewarded for showing a lot of heart preflop. At this point, he has a fairly easy decision of jamming for 68,500. There's a gross spot for me. It may seem like an obvious situation to fold, but now the pot has about 140,000 in the middle and I have just over 50,000 in my stack. I'm getting nearly 3 to 1 on a call, so. I have to have about 27% equity against Terrace's entire range for a call here to be profitable. I don't think Terrace would 4 bet hands like 10s or 9s preflop very often, or maybe ever. I don't necessarily think that he'd jam straights, sets, or pocket aces on this flop either. It'd be better for him to keep my bluffs in, and there's nothing to really be worried about. He probably would have jammed aces or kings preflop anyway. The best non-make-believe hand that I imagine Terrace having is pocket queens, which we have 6 outs against twice plus backdoor flush and backdoor straight outs. Some of the time, Terrace could also have ace king or just two completely random cards, maybe queen jack, maybe king jack. If he's doing this with 10-7, he could easily be doing the same thing with jack eight, or maybe even ace seven suited, or ace eight suited, or perhaps seven five suited. Realistically, it's too difficult to try and get inside of Terrace's brain. The price is too good, I call. We're playing for stacks, it's a pot of $192,000, it's more than double the largest pot that I've ever played in my life. Terrace just wants to run it once. I'm kind of okay with it. I see the 10-7 and it's tough to process the situation. There are a million other flops in which we would have had the opponent dominated, including ones in which neither of us connected at all. Somehow this one comes out. We got 27,000 in each pre-flop and it's me who's dominated. We're not out of it though. It's one of the worst case scenarios for us and we still have almost a one in four chance of winning. I didn't win a single all-in outright yesterday, even when I got it in as a favorite. A win here would more than make up for it. The turn is the six of clubs, giving us a flush draw. Even with one last card to come, our equity jumps up to 33%. Any club, ace or king, will not only allow us to win the biggest pot I've ever played, it'll put us up over $100,000 for the first time ever. If there was a moment to use the one time, it's right now. It isn't to be, though. Okay. Thank you. I get stacked once more on stream, losing my first ever six figure pot to be down 80,000 on the session shortly into it. I was feeling great after winning some hands early on, but now I'm off to an even worse start than I had yesterday. I'm completely deflated. I've never gone through anything like this as a poker player. After giving it tons of thought, the only possible explanation I have for everything going so poorly lately is that 
The universe is punishing me for making the word jiggity so prevalent. I promise to never say it again if I can just run like a normal human. We're in middle position. Steve, who's the tightest player at the table, opens a 30 from early position with pocket jacks. The action's on me. I three bet to 100 with ace queen offsuit. This three bet should get a lot of respect from the other players since I'm three betting a tight player and there are still five players left to act behind me. I can't get through one person though. Andrew makes a call on my immediate left. This sets off some alarm bells. He's gonna have a very narrow range consisting of high pairs and ace king and ace queen type of hands. Nat calls with 8-7 off, which I'm really surprised about, but he was stuck a lot and probably just wants to get in the mix. Folds back to Steve, he flats for 70 more, so we go four ways to the flop and it's ace-queen-jack with two diamonds. We flop top two, but we're way behind Steve's set of jacks. I'm happy to have flopped two pair, but this flop is going to crush my opponent's ranges. Two people cold called my three bet and the tightest player opened and then called my three bet from early position. I put Andrew and Steve on similar ranges of ace-king, ace-queen, pocket tens, jacks, and queens. Of those hands, I'm only beating pocket tens and ace-king. Ace-king is the only hand out of those that could reasonably call a bet. I put Nat on a slightly wider range. He could reasonably have me beat as well, though. Steve checks his set. I have to bet, but honestly, I don't love the situation given the action so far. I bet 175. Looks very strong. Andrew and Nat fold their hands and Steve just calls with his set. This is super interesting because I thought if he had two pair or a set, there's a good chance he'd raise me since there are potentially so many bad cards for him. He's not going to want to see an ace, king, queen, or ten on the turn. The turn is a dream card for me and one of those nightmare cards for Steve. It's another ace, giving me the best possible hand. Steve checks. I go with a small bet of 225. If he has ace king, then he'll have to stick around and he's going to be drawing dead to only three outs. If he has any other full house, it might look to him like I have ace king and he could potentially raise. Steve again just flats, so it really seems like he has ace king. There are four possible combinations of ace king and only three possible combinations of pocket jacks, so for that reason, it's more likely as well. If Steve had pocket queens, I almost definitely would have gotten raised on the flop, and there's only one possible combination of that hand, so I can pretty safely rule it out. The river is a complete blank, it's the seven of spades. Steve checks for a third time. Since he chose not to raise my flop or turn bets, it's pretty clear he's worried that he might not have the best hand. He has 1100 left in his stack and the pot's 1200. I need to decide how much I can bet that will get called by a hand like ace king or possibly bottom full house. I don't think an all in will be the most profitable. I choose to go with 700. Steve snap calls and shows up with the best hand I think he'll ever show up with, given his line. I feel like I played it well. Let's see what the commentators think. I don't know how Brad doesn't shove there. Did you? I mean, if our opponent has ace king and they're going to call 700, they're probably going to call off the 1100 as well. True. Like if you're if somebody's calling 700, they're calling, they're calling off all of it. I mean, plus right. your your shove there looks more bluffy. Okay, so I disagree with the commentators that if he's calling 700 with ace king, then he's also calling 1100. That's a bet of almost 60% more, and it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The other commentator then says that if I shove, it looks more bluffy too, so that's another benefit. Okay, let's look back at this hand one more time. The tightest player at the table opens from early position, and I 3-bet in middle position. I'm almost never 3-betting a tight player's early position raised light when I'm in middle position, also, I get cold called in two spots, and then the tight player calls as well. A high connected flop comes out, and I bet into three players who all have ranges that theoretically should crush this flop. Once again, I'm just never ever having any bluffs in my range, given my line, who my opponents are, and the position I'm in. The turn pairs the board, it's heads up against the tight player, and I fire a second bullet and get called. The river comes out, now I'm going to fire a third bullet. I wouldn't even fire three streets with ace king in this spot. Almost 100% of the time, I'm gonna have a full house, and when I don't, it's because I have quad aces. My opponent's a thinking player, he should realize that no matter what I bet on the river, it's gonna be with a monster hand. If I shove, he's good enough to know that ace king certainly is never good, and pocket jacks are never gonna be good either. I choose a sizing of 700 to target ace king because I think that's by far the most probable hand that he has, given the action. He doesn't raise me with a set on the flop, and he doesn't raise me when he made a boat on the turn. He was clearly worried that I had him beat, which is an even better reason for me not to shove River because then he could have gotten away from bottom full house, and if that ever happens, it would be an absolute disaster. He actually came up to me later and said that if I shoved, then he would have folded. 
Now he did snap call the 700, so I probably could have gotten a little more value, but his hand was a lot stronger than I thought. I can only make decisions based on the information that I have at the time, so I was actually very happy with how I played the hand and surprised that I didn't get raised at any point when I found out what he actually had. I did get 1200 of the 1600 Steve started the hand with, so I feel pretty good. That was the last interesting hand of the stream. I got very lucky to hit a four outer, but Johnny ended up being the big winner. He crushed it and profited around 6,500. I came out as the second biggest winner. I bought in for 1,000 and cashed out for just over 3,000.